I think you'll be okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So for tonight, we'll call the meeting to order. It is Tuesday, October 17th. We are here for Freeport Town Council meeting 2323. Uh, and with us tonight, we have Councillors Pillsbury. Present. Councillor Fournier. Here. Councillor Lawrence. Here. Councillor Bradley. Here. Councillor Egan. Here. And Chair Pilch is here. And Councillor Daniele is excused. Uh, so with that, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next up, we have... Uh, a motion to waive the reading of the minutes of meeting 2223 held on October 3rd and to accept the minutes as printed. So moved. Thank you. Second. Bradley, thank you, Councilor Lawrence. Any questions on the minutes? All in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's six to zero. Uh, announcements. I have just a couple. Uh, I have. Uh, three and actually I have four um, absentee balance are now available for the November 7th state and municipal elections please contact the clerk's office down the hall for more information uh, also 2024 dog licenses are now available you can easily register online at main.gov or at the clerk's office uh, property tax bills have been mailed and are due November 15th um, and lastly, the, uh, I mentioned this last time, the railroad bridge over Route 1 to Lower Main Street is being uh, scheduled for being replaced. And there is a virtual meeting about it on the main DOT website where they go through the project and what the bridge might look like uh, after it's all done and they invite public comments. You can click and look at the video anytime and uh, submit public, co public comments anytime. There's a time limit. I think it's around a month, um, but that's on the main DOT website. And we actually posted a link to that under municipal news on the town's website and on the town's Facebook page. Perfect. Those are all the announcements I have. Anybody else have announcements? Councillor Bradley? Um, I have two high school sports announcements. Um, the first is that the girls' varsity soccer team has made the playoffs. Um, they will be either three or four, and the two teams that are ahead of them, they have lost to by, by only a goal. So they're competitive, and they'll be fun to watch. I also want to give congratulations to the high school golf team on its recent success in the state championship, and Eli Spaulding for winning the number one spot. Wow. That's great. Congratulations to both teams. Any other announcements? How about information exchange? Time for counselors to exchange information with each other. Anybody have information exchange? Councillor Egan. Uh, very briefly, the <clears throat> Housing Committee met last week and is continuing to refine um, some recommendations on specific changes to uh, the land use ordinance to make it a little bit easier for a developer to navigate through for proposals, particularly of uh, housing projects. Um, and also, uh, just want to announce some schedule changes <clears throat> on the um, uh, SREC or Social Racial Equity Committee uh, due to member travel schedules our meeting originally scheduled for next week on the 25th will actually be held on Thursday November 2nd and then our November meeting will be pushed a week because of the Thanksgiving holiday to Wednesday November 29th so uh, SREC will meet at the very beginning and at the very end of November for its October and November meetings. Any other information exchange? Councilor Bradley? Uh, that, with Charlie in the room, I'd just like to say that we've agreed to meet to talk about the mooring uh, ordinance um, to see if um, working, putting our heads together, we can clear up some of the confusion that occurred at the hearing and come up with a, 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 a suggestion about, about how to redo it that meets everybody's needs. Great. Anything else? right along uh, to the town manager's report um, so for stuff um, and other things we have recently posted under municipal news and on the Facebook page is information about the election and if you want to request an absentee ballot if you want to do that 
online, there is a way to do that, so that information's there. Um, and also, we are in desperate need of uh, volunteers to serve on our many, many boards and committees, one of those being the Board of Appeals. So we have some information posted up there. If you're interested in serving on any boards and committees, you can see Chris in the town clerk's office or Carrie, they'd be happy to tell you about the different committees, when they meet, and what kind of obligations um, we're looking for volunteers. Um, also on our website, um, Min, our tax assessor, along with the help of his assistant, um, Louise Tebow and the assessing department, have launched a new online mapping platform through vision appraisal. So you can now go to the assessor's page, pull up the online data. If you pull up vision, vision appraisal, you can pull up a map, you can select a property, you can do a butters. It's a new feature that a lot of other towns have had that Freeport haven't. Um, it did take a lot of data cleanup behind the scenes to get that functioning. Um, so go online and check that out. I know for people applying for permits, especially for on-site agencies, that would be um, a good resource. And then finally, I want to acknowledge the town clerk's office and the finance part department, in particular Robert Doak. Um, the town of Freeport, due to their hard work, received the Supreme Award for our annual town report, and that was given out at the recent May Municipal Convention. So congratulations to those employees who did a lot of work behind the scenes right. and were acknowledged at the convention. That's all I have for you. That's kind of a hot streak, isn't it? Don't we have a, a whole array of those awards? It is a hot streak. <laughs> Pressure's on now for next year. Pressure's on and <clears throat> sure, they're not gonna ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for the manager? Uh, all right, next up is our public comment period. Uh, so I'll go over the rules, um, but this is a time for the public to comment uh, on anything that's not already on our agenda. Uh, two of the items on our agenda are official public hearings, but if you have comments on any of the other agenda items, just indicate and we're happy to take those comments as well when we get to those agenda items. Um, but this is a time to comment on anything else. So if you have something to say, Everybody gets three minutes. We ask that you tell us who you are, where you're from, and, uh, and it's not a time for back and forth debate with the council, just a time to share your views. So with that, anybody can step up to the podium and kick us off. Good evening. My name's Peter Renswini. I'm from South Freeport, South Freeport Road. Um, every once in a while, I like to remind the council um, what I believe um, our government is supposed to do. Um, so in a republic, we're always searching for a balanced center. Um, the search can go from no law to people's law to ruler's law. Our constitutional republic was based on people's law model. The American founders wanted rulemaking closest to the people. They believed that the local control of, and focus uh, better qualified to take care of their poor, their roads, their property rights, their zoning, their self-policing. The federal government in Maine and Freeport um, and the school committees um, are moving towards a path of ruler's law. Uh, there are many examples in, the, in this movement. School consolidation a few years back, public transportation that started as a $25,000 project, fight against uh, parental rights that are going on in school right now, zoning usurpation by LD 2003, um, COVID emergency declaration of um, not quite sure what emergency means, climate solution, general assistance, immigration. If you're not aware of ruler's law concept, these are the major premises. Government power is exercised by force, police power, conquest through funding, or legislation, legislative usurpation. All power is concentrated in the rulers. People are treated as subjects, and the land is treated as a realm. Um, people have no unalienable rights. The thrust of government is always from the rulers down. Silence in a lot of cases is considered approval, and it's really not. Um, problems are solved by issuing new edicts, creating more, more bureaus, appropriating more administration, char uh, changing people's more, or charging people more taxes to pay for these services. Under this system, taxes and government regulations are always oppressive. 
freedom is never considered a solution. Um, the long history of rulers' law is one of oppression, and those in power revel in luxury while the common people are perpetual poverty. Excessive taxation, stringent regulation, continuous existence. In summary, the council and the school boards put policies that involve children and spending, uh, should put policies that involve children and spending to the, up to the voters. This evening, you will be touching on several pieces of, of several ordinances that are examples of rulers' law. And I want to make sure that you keep that in mind, that really we have, you know, the policy that the town should have is one of people's law. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Anybody else have public comment to share with the council on non-agenda items? Non-agenda items? Yes, non-agenda items. Um, yeah, my name is Bill Rickson, and... Uh, I live at 66 Marney Road here in town. Um, two weeks ago, I was here and spoke to you about uh, the fact that the Sustainability Advisory Board was discussing the uh, Fossil Fuel non proliferation Treaty, which is a worldwide treaty that, and anyway, they were, they were sometime in the near future, they probably will be coming to you to talk to you about that and then uh, share with you what they've learned. Um, Tonight I'm here uh, on a related matter in that uh, there is a treaty on the pro pro prohibition of nuclear weapons which is being considered, again, worldwide. And there's a UN meeting on this uh, coming up at the end of November. Um, and I sent all of you uh, an email about this uh, item. Um, I'm not sure if you would have an opportunity to look at it. I'm sure your emails uh, boxes are quite full. But uh, anyway, I wanted to come tonight to just to mention that I had sent you this letter about this and uh, that uh, I hope you'll have a chance to look at it and consider it in the next month, because this is at the end of November that this meeting is. And uh, in, the let in the letter that I sent you, it's also asking you to consider signing an open letter to President Biden uh, to encourage him to have the U.S. government send a, um, a, a uh, well, Biden in the administration, they were at the moment, they are not aligned with the treaty. And this would, this letter would be asking President Biden Biden to send an observer delegation, which would uh, show that we're, as a country, are, we're, are thinking about this issue and that it would also be a good uh, message to other nations that today do possess nuclear weapons. Uh, so hopefully you'll take a look at that letter that I had sent you and uh, you'll consider it over the next month. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Good evening. I'm Bob Stevens from 50 Moose Crossing, and I would like to use my three minutes. That's not mine running out already, I hope. <laughs> Seven seconds left. <laughs> uh, to address uh, two items, one of which is on your agenda, but it's in executive session. There will not be an opportunity to speak there. Uh, so I'd like to address that item now, which is, what to do about the possibility of acquiring 22 Main Street. Um, we missed an opportunity years ago, and it just didn't fit in at that time, apparently, in the view of, of the town. Um, just recently, we all know that Paul Peck, a developer, proposed something, put a lot of work into it. The end result, uh, it didn't go forward. Um, there were a lot of people that are interested, were, are, for various reasons, uh, opposing it. But I think in the town, there just there's a great feeling that that's a piece of property that fits in so well 
what, what we've got here. We've got the town hall, then we have a piece of property, and then we have the public safety building. Together, it's a nice unit showing this is what Freeport, the, what it is to come into Freeport. So um, if, if there is an opportunity to acquire it, I think it's worth the council considering a very seriously that, uh, that, it, that it do be acquired. The, um, I don't think it's going to work. I think a developer in the future will probably be scared off for a while, which gives us the opportunity to do something that would, is perhaps in the best interest of the town. Now, I don't know exactly what the town would do with it, but I don't think we should wait around for a plan we should realize this is a piece of property that's available now. It's like putting money in the bank, have it there, and it will be useful in the future. My second item has to do with, I've heard that there's talk of L.L. Bean being interested in acquiring the um, Bartow Island, uh, Bartow uh, Library. And um, I hope that uh, that does not proceed. I think there's enough of L.L. Bean on Main Street right now. I think there's an opportunity to have that space used by something else. I think what has happened just in the last year or so is a revitalization taking place on Main Street, Meeting House start started, other places are starting to fill in. Give it time. I think it can be used for public purposes, and uh, that is what I would like to say. Thank you. else for public comment in the room? I know we've got one hand on Zoom as well. Uh, we'll go to Zoom. Got All right, you have Joyce Fayou I just brought over. Joyce Fayou. Hello, Joyce. Good evening, everyone. I uh, just two quick items. One, I wanted to thank everybody for last um, town council meeting. I neglected to thank you for extending my time. I was in such a hurry to get home. So I just wanted to say thank you. That was very much appreciated. My second item is the cemetery work. We finished with Porter's Landing, and we're going to be moving on next year to the first parish cemetery that's on the side road beside Wilbur's. And it has a beautiful rock wall around it that is from the early 1800s, but it needs a bit of work. And so I wanted to put it out there. If anybody knows of someone who understands rock walls and how to repair them and would like to volunteer their time, uh, I'd love to talk to them and see if we can work something out so that we can do some repairs to the wall at the same time as we stand up all the headstones. So thank you. Thank you, Joyce. <clears throat> Any other public comment? Going once, going twice, all done with public comment. Okay, I don't see any other hands on Zoom. Uh, so I'll move on to um, our seventh order of business, which is where we take uh, action on items. Tonight we have seven items to vote on, plus a couple of executive session items that we don't anticipate voting on. Uh, the first of which is, uh, the first item of which is a uh, consent agenda. Uh, where we group uh, tonight, there's five things grouped as one that we'll vote on together unless anyone sees reason to separate them. Seeing none. Uh, we've got some sponsorships from businesses who contributed towards our fireworks display on July 4th to approve. Some resignations, a uh, warden for the election, and uh, ours uh, for the registrar of voters for the week prior to the election. So. Uh, any questions on the consent agenda? No, seeing none, I'll move. Uh, that be it ordered that the October 17th, 2023 consent agenda be adopted. Second. Thank you, Councilor Lawrence. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's everybody six to zero. Uh, next up, we have item 192-23, which is the first of two public hearings tonight. This one is to consider action relative to amendments to chapter 23. Our sign ordinance uh, pertaining to provisions regarding signs in the public right of way. So I'll ask Caroline for an overview and then we'll open it for public hearing, and then we'll have council discussion. 
Sure, we talked a little bit about this at the last meeting. Um, we we're working with ordinance committee to do some substantial updates to the sign ordinance. In that was a provision that was flagged by staff but requested by one of our businesses to allow signs in the public right of way. Um, our ordinance has strictly prohibited them. In certain parts of town, such as Independence Drive, Lower Main Street, Mallet Drive, we have these really wide old right of ways. And so when we drive by and see signs, they look like they're in the lawns of businesses when in fact they're in the right of way. So if they want to do anything beyond repair, um, such as replace the sign, they can't do it because it was prohibited. The state of Maine has a provision if you want to allow a sign um, in close proximity or in a right of way, you can go to the state. So here we're proposing a, a similar, much smaller scale um, that you could get a, allow a sign to be permitted in the public right of way with review and approval from the town manager. Um, you could switch that to council, but councils in the past haven't wanted <laughs> that coming. What we've done in, in the past, our practice had been to sometimes allow these or other structures and whoever was installing the sign on their property would just kind of sign an agreement acknowledging that they're aware that we're allowing this to go in the right of way, but if we ever need it removed, if it gets damaged by the plow, et cetera, um, that they'd be responsible or it would be removed. Um, so that's just a snapshot. It's just 4.8, that one provision. Um, quick question, does the Director of Public Works or the Police Chief have input on that? Yeah, request? that's what we would normally do. would okay. go to Earl and Public Safety and have them weigh in before we right. signed anything. Thought that was in there. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, we didn't go into that detail, but that's how it works behind the scenes. All right. Uh, so we'll open up the public hearing first. Uh, if there's anybody who wants to speak to the sign ordinance changes. Perfect. Now tell us who you are and where you're from. But uh, my husband and I own Chilton Furniture, 184 um, Lower Main Street. And so we're the business that wanted to update our sign. We got it through the sign ordinance committee, and um, then we're told we needed to move it five feet back. You know, for obvious reasons, we, we like the idea that you would have this amendment so that you at least have the, we have, would have the opportunity to present our case, and you could weigh the cost to the business of having reduced visibility, um, you know, against the perceived benefit to the town. In our case, we don't think there is one, but I understand I would have to present that and hopefully convince you of that. But I think it, it is a, you know, a good flexibility for you to have to be obviously um, you know, helpful to businesses who are trying to rebrand and improve and um, evolve. So I think as it is now with this um, inability for you to make an exception, I think it sort of limits um, what it, it's a disincentive it's essentially for businesses to update. I mean, other than just repair, if they want to evolve, it's yeah, you know, it's well, we have to move it back, so let's just not do it. So hopefully you'll consider it, and it's my plea. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for your comments and thanks for your patience. I know you've been waiting for us to act on this for a long time. So. Any other public comment on the sign ordinance? <clears throat> Andy Wilbur, uh, 32 <coughs> Independence Drive, also Wilbur's Main Chocolate Confections. Uh, we're one of the businesses that had <coughs> has actually two signs that are in the public right away that were approved prior to the current uh, rule following. Um, so we also would be, uh, uh, and, and if you're on that section of, uh, of Lower Main Street, uh, you can probably count 10 or 15 signs that are uh, anywhere between uh, six inches away from the road and, uh, and um, you know, uh, six or ten feet away from the road, but still well within the right-of-way because it is so large. Um, so, uh, although many of them are not here tonight, uh, any of them that would need to modify their sign beyond the repairs uh, would have the sim similar implications to what Chilton's experienced. Um, the other piece I was... Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's if I'm out of order in asking this, but um, when um, uh, when there was discussion about the sign ordinance being revised, we had asked that um, <coughs> building size and uh, and number of signs per building be looked at as well. It's been problematic for us in our Bow Street location uh, uh, because we wanted uh, lettering on our awnings, which each of those counts as a sign, and 
13 and 15 Bow Street are sometimes considered two buildings and sometimes considered one building. And in the interpretation was considered one building, so we had to reduce the number of awnings that we could say candy on um, because, uh, because of the number of signs allowed, allowed in that scenario. So um, advocacy for that, if we can revisit that at some point as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. I know there's, there's further changes to the sign ordinance in the works, um, so that's not been forgotten, but not part of tonight's agenda. Hello again. Um, my, my, um, my concern deals with the temporary sign ordinance. Um, in the way that it's written, I believe that it doesn't comply with the current state uh, requirements. Um, our sign ordinance for political signs usually is, is listed as 30 days. I believe the state uses a six weeks window um, as opposed to 30 days. Um, there's also some items on there like you can't put signs on fences. I'm assuming that that's not private fences um, and that's public fences, but there are components of the sign, temporary sign ordinance that really need to be re looked at to match the state requirements. Also, there's some enforcement component of the sign ordinance that it, from what I understand, the state is the only, uh, they only have the right to come in and judge uh, political signs. So it's not a town function to do that. Um, and I, I think that was, um, we came across that about two years ago. Um, so that might be another area that you might need to look at. Um, there's also, there's also um, components of the sign ordinance that says, well, you can't have lights on your signs. Well, does that mean that your building can't be outlined in lights? Um, so there's, there's really a lot of components of the sign ordinance that needs clarification. So thank you. Any other public comments regarding the changes to the sign ordinance? Anybody online? No hands. All right, so we'll close the public hearing and move it up for council discussion. Anybody up here have questions about uh, the sign ordinance? Council Bradley. I, I just want to be sure I, I understand. The only thing we're voting on is 4.8. Y yes, yep. The ordinance committee still needs to revisit Okay. All the other things. But tonight's vote started. is limited to the change that's proposed in 4.8. Mm -hmm. Councilor Fournier. Uh, so, Caroline, uh, we've heard quite a bit of input and whatever, and I'm sure you took good notes. So, when are we uh, going to be revisiting this? So, the Ordinance Committee started to look at it, this and another topic, both of which warrant, they had good discussion, both of which warranted some legal review and getting those committees back together. In this case, some of the ones mentioned tonight are already in the works but are, are complicated. Um, the sign in the right of way, the business has been patiently waiting. Originally it got absorbed into the much bigger change because it seemed like it could more easily stand alone and be considered fairly straightforward. We, after consulting with leadership, pulled that out and brought it to you. But if you're lucky enough to be appointed to the ordinance committee after elections, I think you'll be taking this up with some of these items. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Bradley. So <clears throat> I have a question. Um, 4.8 reads, district setback requirements shall not apply to signs, period. And then it, the next word is no, but the N in no is grayed out which usually means it doesn't exist, which would mean that the sentence would start with an O. If that's right, then we should fix it. It should be a period and then a capital, capital N, N yeah. starting the new sentence. Oh, so yeah. you could, it's, mine is just screwed up. Yeah, it's hard to tell it's in the gray. Yeah. Color, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so no sign shall be located, et cetera. Yeah. I got that part, but it didn't. I, it looked to me like the N was grayed out, meaning deleted. So I didn't. I just want to be sure. Yeah, capitalized there. Okay. Councilor Fournier. I think I know the answer to this, but I, I don't think we've had any problems where signs have been allowed in these uh, 
areas uh, over the years, correct? Um, yeah, I can't, I mean, so signs in the right of way aren't appropriate on all locations, like the middle of a sidewalk or where they're gonna obstruct, obstruct public passage, but we haven't had any issues, I think, with either the landowner or, or from the town's perspective when we've okayed these or some other things in the right of way. Nobody wants to put a sign where it's gonna get hit by a plow or destroyed in snow removal. Any other discussion? Councilor Pillsbury, do you wanna do the honors on this? Sure. Be it ordered that amendments to chapter 23 sign ordinance pertaining to a provision regarding signs in the public right of way be approved. Second. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carries six to zero. Uh, thanks again for your patience and your comments. Uh, next item, 193.23, to consider action relative to approving proposed amendments to Chapter 46, which is our general assistance ordinance. These are just updating our maximum allowances, which uh, we do every year. Um, and it's time for us to do it for this year. Uh, we have a public hearing on this as well. Do we also have Sarah? Yeah, we have online? Sarah from FCS online. I'll promote her okay. as a panelist. Okay, thank you. And Sarah, I know we talked about this last time, but if you wanna give a very quick update just for the folks who are new tonight so they understand what it is we're about to vote on, that would be helpful. Sorry, do you mind repeating that? As you were saying, it was switching me to oh, panelist and I for a that, second that's so fine you repeat the question, I appreciate it. not a problem I'll, I'll repeat mine and my my request was for you to repeat yours so uh <laughs> even though you told us last time what this was about if you don't mind uh reminding us again for the folks that are new tonight so they'll understand what it is we're about to vote on sure so every year um kind of as you introduced it we do need to update our general assistance maximums these maximum levels are set by the state um, so this year, what we are updating is Appendix A, which is the overall maximum. We are also updating Appendix B, um, which is for food specifically, and then Appendix C, which is relative to housing. Um, for housing, we're looking at an increase of about $75 per person. Um, and then with food, it's about $10 per person. So overall maximum, we're looking like $90 to $100 per person um, for an increase which is pretty standard with, with each year. Got it. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Um, so we have a public hearing to do for this. So I'll open the public hearing and if anyone has comments on these new general assistance maximums, now's the time to step up and tell us what you think. Hello again. Um, so, I'm not quite, I, I don't quite understand this. So, it says a municipality has, can set up a minimum of payment, but you have to follow USDA to, to not be below their guideline. So, what exactly does the town have to say about all of this? That's really the question that the, the write-up really doesn't explain to us or to me what what are your goals out of this you know is it why don't you just say okay usda sets the limit and we're done with it so that's where the confusion is on my part I municipalities mean, may establish their own maximum levels of assistance provided for proposed levels of assistance and then below it it says municipality maximum assistance um, for food, and, which is issued by USDA. So you can set your own, but some USDA kind of controls it. I, I don't understand that. Thank you. Like any other questions from the public? And then, Sarah, if you don't mind, I'll throw that one to you after we're done with the public hearing. Uh, sure. Is there any other public comment on this? Anybody online? All right, um, so we'll close the public hearing and then I'll turn it over to Sarah to, if she has uh, information on that. Ooh. Sarah, do you mind uh, addressing that comment that was brought up? Yeah, no, sorry, I, I apologize. Um, absolutely happy to do that. 
Um, the town definitely does have the option to adopt their own guidelines. Um, the ones set by the state are pretty standard and generally what other municipalities use. Um, so, you know, I understand that that the USDA DA does have involvement in setting, in, in particular, the food maximum, which makes sense. Um, you know, when you think about SNAP benefits and other resources that are available to folks, um, you know, it's it. To me, anyways, it makes sense that that would influence what the state then recommends. Um, you know, when if a municipality were to set their own standards or their own guidelines, there there does become concern about whether or not it would then actually be be reimbursed by the state. Um, so by following these guidelines, although they tend to be quite low in, in just in, in all reality, to be perfectly honest with you, it's, it's very difficult for someone to meet their needs through general assistance. Um, you know, it, it has been what's worked for a municipality up to this point, um, but certainly again, the council could, if they wanted to consider um, adopting their own maximums. I don't know if I answered your question. Let me know if I didn't, I'm happy to try again. Hey. Okay. It's got more or less a scent. Um, Sarah, I do have one question for you. On the page that is going to have our signatures on it, there are some yes. dates. I just want to confirm that we're filling in the right dates. Um, it says these shall be in effect from October 1, is that October 1, 2023 through September 30th, 2024? Correct. Got it. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Questions. Can I potentially put a plug in for something while I sure. sign up you guys quickly? Sure. <laughs> That's appropriate. Um, I just wanted to share with you that I met yesterday with the families that are staying at Casco Bay Inn um, to let them know about the resources that we have at the community center. One of the reoccurring frustrations, um, I would say safety concerns and just general issues that the families are running into, which will be no surprise to any of you, is um, the issue of transportation. So I'm just putting a plug out there that if any of you got if like any of you have um, relationships with anyone um, or know anyone who's a part of the Metro, it would be really, really beneficial to have some ad additional advocacy for a bus stop, which I know we've been asking for now for two years, <laughs> um, in front of the Casco Bay Inn, the families are are really struggling lately with the issue of transportation. Got it. And the program we had last year, which I think was grant funded, that's no longer available, is that right? No, they are doing that. So they are running a similar bus as to what we had, um, but it, it's to go north with the RTP bus because it basically only goes south. Mm. Um, someone would have to go to Hannaford in Yarmouth to catch the bus to come up to, let's say, town, you know, the town um, hall in Freeport. And it's, it's a very confusing process to navigate. The schedule is not ideal. They're working with the, you know, the bare minimum, but doing the best they can. Um, but ultimately having a, an actual bus stop there would serve the families and I think the area in general quite well. Got it. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah. Bradley. Yeah, Sarah, I'd, I'm, you may already know this, but there is a transportation committee set up under downtown visioning and it meets tomorrow to renew its um, commitment to tr general transportation development throughout the community and to our outside assets. So it would be a great place for someone from FCS to B um, to become part of that discussion or to connect with somebody like Mary Davis or Tawny or Kathy Smith uh, to see um, uh, how you could integrate into that discussion. I'll reach out to them tomorrow or tonight actually and then try and get in um, to those meetings as soon as possible. Thank you for that. Okay. Councilor Fournier. Uh, sir, have you reached out to Portland? Uh, it, yeah, Portland, you know, uh, Move the people here, and and I know we tried to have discussions, and we didn't have any. So, uh, have you reached out? Are you getting any help from them? Yes or no? They are helping so much more this time than they did last time, which I'm I'm very happy to report. Um, they had staff from the city of Portland on site during the meeting that I was at yesterday. 
Um, they are providing for their basic needs. They are um, really, I, I mean, our role this time is immensely different from what it was last time. Basically, you know, if folks come to FCS, they are welcome to utilize our services, but we are not bringing any services on site as we did last time because the city of Portland is so actively involved. Um, so they, you know, we've had a few transportation meetings, um, you know, just to try and support the city of Portland in getting um, a bus stop there. So there's definitely efforts this time. I'm really happy to share that with you all because I know uh, last time around it was not the case. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, Councillor Fournier, would you care to read the be it ordered? I can. Be it ordered uh, that amendments to Chapter 46, General Assistance Ordinance and Appendix A-H for a period of October 1st, 2023 to September 30th, 2024 be approved. Second. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, carries six to zero. I'll pass down a, a piece of paper they will have to sign for that. Uh, next up is item 194.23 to consider action relative to setting a public hearing uh, to discuss amendments to our community antenna television ordinance or cable TV ordinance. Uh, and I think all this is doing is changing, being consistent about how many people are on our committee that deals with cable TV because there's some inconsistency there. Is there yeah. anything you want to add to that? No, that's exactly it. We have, have the, your microphone on. I've got it on. I don't want to get yelled at. Um, the, the community antenna ordinance calls for a seven-member seven board. However, our admin code calls for a five-member board. Um, with our struggles on filling boards, we felt as though the five-member board would at least get us up and running. And so we're looking for the consistency the there to switch it to five. Sense. Any questions? Councilor Bradley? Yeah, I, I <laughs> having had something to do with the filling of the cable board from almost zero to five and feeling pretty good about that, it seems like we may be in a moving target situation. And I guess, um, does this affect at all um, the uh, either the quorum or the requirement that the committee will meet um, before we fill these two positions? So right now we have five members. I know. So if you go to seven tonight. We're, we're going no, to we're five. trying to, okay. Five. We're trying to reduce it to five. Oh, so, I misunderstood. Yeah. That's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think we picked up a vote there. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? All right. Uh, Councillor Lawrence, would you care to read the be it order for setting the public Sure. Be it ordered that a public hearing be set for December 5th, uh, 2023 at the meeting starting at 6 p.m. in Town Council Chambers, 30 Main Street, to discuss amendments to Chapter 6 to change the committee membership requirements to 5 from 7 to be consistent with Chapter 2, Section 611 of the Administrative Code. Do we have a second? I'll second. second it. Thank you, Councilor <laughs> Egan. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll sleep tonight. Huh? Any uh, further discussion? All right. All in favor of setting the public hearing? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Very six to Always zero. Just to it. I know. Uh, just a, a note on the dates. We we anticipate we have a meeting on our calendar for next week. We anticipate it's a short meeting, probably with one or two agenda items. And then we have our organization meeting, which happens after elections, and then we don't meet again until December 5th. So. A few weeks away. Um, next up, we have item 195.23, which is uh, to consider action relative to approving our Freeport Momentum Grant Program. This is just sort of filling out the committee that we've talked about in the past. And I think Brett's here to give us a little bit of background on what we're doing tonight and remind us of what we've already done. Hey everybody, uh, Brett Richardson, Executive Director of the Freeport Economic Development Corporation, here to uh, ask for appointments to the Momentum Grant Committee. Uh, the Grant Committee will make selections on allocations of the $40,000 that the Town Council allocated for the Momentum Program. 
Momentum program is a sister program to the uh, Business Fit Up grant program, which is currently out in the community. And I'm pretty optimistic we'll have some good proposals coming back in the next few weeks on that, which will be great. Um, the Momentum Committee um, will help allocate funds for projects that will be highly visible downtown uh, to activate public spaces and encourage folks to, to hang out downtown and spend more time. So I think it'll be a great, uh, it'll be a great program that'll help advance the downtown vision. And the committee, uh, it's a great group, pretty diverse, um, thoughtful people. Uh, Phil Wagner has offered to uh, represent the Complete Streets Committee. Jonas Werner, uh, former business owner downtown and in the real estate business um, with a good eye for downtown vitality. Kathy Smith, her name's already come up once tonight around transportation for the downtown vision. She's a thoughtful person. And then um, with some good hard work in the community, we also have a, uh, a Freeport High School student, which I'm excited about. It'll be good to have that perspective. Uh, Enoch Boudreau is gonna help out there. And then uh, the eventual town manager once appointed um, will be the five person committee if you guys will support that and the committee gets to make decisions on the funding without having to come back to the council right exactly average project 2500 bucks to five grand uh, relatively quick hitters um, hopefully highly visible and good good opportunities to learn awesome thanks brad Councilor bradley sure. uh, brad could you just uh, tell me the difference between this and the sixty thousand dollars that went goes yeah, to the uh, sure so uh $100,000 total, uh, 60,000 bucks will go to the uh, Freeport Business Fit Up program, which is really designed to activate vacant commercial spaces, bring new businesses into town. Whereas this program is more on the street, more in public spaces that are highly visible and publicly accessible. So um, really almost more um, community spaces, whereas the Fit Up program is really about economic development. Thanks. Other questions? Councilor Bradley, would you like to read this order? Be it ordered. Be it ordered that the following individuals be appointed to the Momentum Grant Committee. One, Phil Wagner, Complete Streets Committee Representative. Two, Jonas Werner, Downtown Vision Representative. Three, Kathy Smith, Downtown Vision Representative. Four, Enoch Boudreau, Freeport High School Student Representative. <laughs> and five, the Town Manager, when and if we ever have. <laughs> I know we're getting one. I know we're getting one. Soon. Second. Thank you, Council Lorenz. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor of the appointments? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It carries six to zero with our thanks, Mr. Richardson, for your work on this. Uh, item 196-23 is next uh, to consider action relative to a request from the Complete Streets Committee to hire a grant writer uh, for an amount up to $8,000 uh, to assist with a large grant, is what I understand. So Barbara is gonna tell us about that. So my name is Barbara Guffin and I'm representing Complete Streets. First of all, I'd like to thank you for all you are doing for the town of Freeport. From my perspective, I see that you have lots of meetings and work long hours, and I'm very grateful for your time, energy, and dedication. The Complete Streets Committee is here this evening to request up to $8,000 to hire a contract position grant writer to assist with the Town of Freeport's application for a land and water use conservation fund grant that has a due date of June 2024. These funds would be used to design and build an off-road multi-use trail parallel to US Route 1 from Pine Street to downtown Freeport in accordance with the Freeport Downtown Vision Plan discussed by Freeport Town Council on February 7th of this year. Now by downtown Freeport, I mean to Summer Street, so just a bit um, north of the new railroad bridge overpass, just south of the fire station. And uh, Adam was going to put up a map to show that at some point. And the grant would help us with design and address topography, environmental questions, right of way, and other issues. For background, the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act of 64, 1964 was established to assist federal, state, and federal local governments in the acquisition and indoor development of public outdoor recreation facilities. These grants can provide up to 50% of the allowable costs for the approved projects. 
The application period is usually open through June 30th, and the maximum grant award in 2023 was $500,000. This grant writer would coordinate, prepare, and oversee the application. Essentially, the grant writer would be responsible for keeping the Complete Streets Committee on target, reviewing our narratives in the different sections of the application, and editing the documents to ensure all connection points and consistency issues are addressed. The Complete Streets Committee estimates it will take an experienced grant writer earning $50 to $100 per hour and working with the committee no more than 80 hours to prepare, final edit, and submit a grant proposal that meets these requirements. Since the due date for the grant is June 30th, we're hoping to have someone on board by December or January. Thank you very much for your consideration into this matter. Thanks, Barbara. Anybody have questions for Ms. Govan? Councilor Bradley? I have a couple. Um, one, w w this goes to Summer Street. Why didn't it go the whole length of the proposed Frost Gully transit? Like into downtown, or are you talking about all the way to YMCA? I'm talking, well, you're going, oh, you, this goes from. Pine Street. Well, we're. I thought Pine, it is going from south into town. That's the part of it that I remember talking about, but it went much further than Summer Street. When we talked about it, it didn't stop there. There was a, there was a split, a division, um, said one would go up and hit Main Street, but then there would be a remainder of the trail that would go in to the west and um, towards Bow Street, as I recall. Am I wrong? We're working on the whole trail, but I think we were just identifying a segment of it to make it more manageable and because the funding wouldn't cover the entire thing. Why is it manageable not to deal with the whole trail all at once? I mean, I could see going from YMCA, you know, from Cousins River Bridge to Summer Street. Is that the piece? That's, or, okay, that's what you told me. Why to aren't you going Street? beyond that okay. all the way to because the end? Because then we're getting into, the way I look at it is that's downtown is Summer Street, so the downtown is a separate piece of it that we haven't looked at yet. Yeah, I'd like, I, I, I mean, I don't have any problem with going after grant money, usually, mm -hmm. um, and don't hear, but I, I hate to see us break al already a project up that's got pieces into more pieces so that, mm -hmm. you know, you never know what you're, whether you're getting what you want or whether you're just getting a piece of what you want. So let's go for the whole thing. I'm asking, I'm not telling. Thank you, Barbara. You, you're doing a tremendous job. Um, to clarify, we're talking about the Concord Brook Trail portion that is priority one. And that, that segment runs from Pine Street to Concord Road. Um, that is the multi-use path section. So come up Concord Road, connect to Main Street, and go to the railroad bridge. That is the, that's the the, the scope of this grant application. Um, it will connect into existing infrastructure, um, sidewalks that are already in place. Um, Councilor Bradley, the, the West Street connection you're talking about will not be a full width path. It'll be more of a, um, like a nature trail, so to speak, because there are limitations in terms of wetlands and floodplain and streams. That segment going to west is just a nature trail, like a walking trail, whereas this grant covers a full multi-use path um, from Pine to Concord. So it leaves me still with the question, you know, you're, you're going to come back, you, the, the, the Complete Streets, whoever is going to run this project is going to come back if you're successful and then ask for the nature trail provision to be addressed next. And, Fair, fair guess? It's already in place, isn't it? There's um, trails there. Yeah, I know. Yes, um, but it's, it's an entirely different uh, scope. Um, I don't see construction really in, as part of that. It's going to be free? It won't be free, right. but, but there will be, you know, uh, easements um, covered by the Concord Gully, I believe, credit enhancement agreement. Um, 
I don't know what's going to be involved. I just remember from the discussion that there was going to be two pieces to this, and one was going to be more expensive and more comprehensive, and one was going to be more, you know, for the nature guy, the, the outdoor enthusiast, the person who was, you know, more physically fit. But it also is very interesting to have that in your downtown. Um, to, one, to put it off makes no sense to me. Two, uh, to come back for another funding request for something that you could possibly get wedged into this makes less sense to me um, because you've got a huge fully supported downtown vision priority project in focus and now you're going to split it up so that's my question i don't know what's right or wrong but that's why i asked it um, i'd like to see you go for the whole thing um and now i've forgotten the second question <laughs> that's all right i'll come back to it um while you're thinking um I have a couple of questions. The maximum grant award for this particular grant is $500,000, right? Mm -hmm. Which wouldn't cover the whole trail, I don't think, right? Okay. Um, my other question is, do, didn't we already allocate some money for this in our capital plan or other grant monies? I remember discussing some of this, but I don't remember the details. Um, there is money programmed in the five-year capital plan. I believe it's FY28. Um, it, but that's obviously four or five years down the road. I think it was sooner. I'll show it as FY24. I don't know if it wound up there, but that's where we're talking. But there was also $250,000 worth of grant money. Does that sound familiar? That's for Mallet Drive? That's for Mallet Drive, yes. And both of those numbers are for Mallet Drive, my mistake. Okay. We're going back into the history of the development of these priorities, but uh, my understanding was that there would be some budgetary um, commitment uh, which would be used only if we weren't able to get grants like this to meet the need. Um, so, again, I go back. You've got to, uh, let, let's go for all the grant money we can. I don't know. Maybe everybody knows exactly what this section is going to cost, and it will eat up the whole $500,000. Maybe not. be a shame to leave some $60,000 on the table, which might be enough to do the nature trail. I don't know. But at least would you take a look at it? Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Pillsbury. Uh, a couple of things. Is it is it a product? So I'm looking at the map, and it looks like the piece that we're talking about has been designed and engineered, and so it seems that that's more suitable for a grant application. Um, the piece that we're discussing, it seems like it's loose at best. Is that why we're not going to Ed's point out to try to solicit funding? For it because we don't have a formulated plan yet because we haven't focused the design and engineering time on that piece yet uh, that's a that's a good way to put it um, I go back to nature trail um, uh, to illustrate that this is a wooded condition it's a nature trail those trails are largely in place um, you know they're blazed by LL Bean and we do have some work to do with them to determine that connection as well as some landowner outreach, but um, they're two contextually d distinct types of paths, yeah. nature versus 10, for example, 10 foot wide bike, bicycle pedestrian path. Thanks. Um, what's the process when we hire a consultant, or if, <coughs> excuse me, if we're gonna have a grant writer, what's the process for uh, monitoring and approving the work as it comes in i mean who's who's checking that is that town staff is that complete streets uh i apologize are you referring to design phase or the the grant the eight thousand to assist with the with the grant application so who's who's checking to make sure deliverables are hit timelines are met uh approving you know, submission of, of timesheets, things like that. I just, I'm just curious how it works and what the check and balance is. As far as the grant application goes, um, the Complete Streets Committee would uh, work with them, that person by, under contract to prepare the application, work with the um, Land and Water Conservation Fund to make sure that all of those check boxes are checked and the application is complete. Um, they would not be an employee, is my understanding. It would, they would be a contracted person. And so they would submit an invoice, and that would, um, that would get routed through the appropriate uh, town staff person. 
Okay. It was it was just the description was a little unclear as to how what the mechanism for payment would be in terms of is it just here's the contract it's eight thousand dollars to do the grant or it's up to X number of hours at a rate between you know fifty and a hundred dollars an hour. I see. So I'm just wondering the logistics of how we ensure good stewardship of the money. Mm -hmm. Good question. I don't have those answers right now, but I can assure you. Uh, there would be excellent oversight of that that work. Oh, I have no doubt. I'm just curious what the what the process was. And yeah, um, we like to keep it local. If you're interested in knowing, we like to keep it local and reach out to local residents who have grant writing experience. Um, we all know someone. I'm convinced there's at least one of us in this room that knows somebody who has grant writing experience, and that person probably lives in town. Um, but uh, per finance policy, we would issue a quotation um, to those uh, prospective um, bidders. Great. Thanks. Councilor Bradley. I remembered. <laughs> is there a, uh, for the $500,000 grant, is there a match required? Yes, 50-50 match. So when, <laughs> so when we submit this, we are saying to the granting organization that if you grant us a half a million, We'll give you half a million for this project. That's the $500,000 question. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a uh, part of the grant application. You have to demonstrate council um, uh, commitment to that match. It's it's I don't know if you call it chicken, egg, cart, horse, <laughs> or this iterative type of proceed process. But um, so we're going to spend eight thousand dollars to find out whether this council will, will match up to five hundred thousand dollars of a grant. The way this is going to work yeah. is you're going to hire somebody for $8,000. You're going to put a grant application in for $500,000, which is going to carry with it a $500,000 commitment from whoever this council is at that moment. It's an excellent point. It opens up the next question if we're, we want to discuss it is what is the funding source or source says for that match? Um, and I don't know if we're prepared to have that or if we even have those answers yet. But... Um, uh, Maybe it's a combination of forces or sources from private fundraising, I don't know, to leveraging local dollars to grant dollars. Are we going for the whole 500000 or is it part of that? Like, we think we need this much money. We need to cover construction, we should go for the entire okay. amount. And um, at the recent Complete Streets Committee meeting, that was the temperature of the, of the room of the committee members. I, for one, remember meeting with Complete Streets and said, go out and get grants and apply for grants. Thank you for doing it. Uh, and uh, what I'm hearing, and this is not going to slow down our processes on moving our goals that's been identified by Complete Streets and also identified by the downtown visioning. We'll have to make a decision if we're successful, which I hope we are, uh, but so I'm excited that we're finally going out because I think we've overtaxed our, a lot of our volunteers. We've overtaxed our staff. So this, I think, is a solution to move forward, and I'm going to support it to see where we end up. I agree. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And, and I think this is partly in response to the invitation we made to say, no, we, won't, we don't want to hire a full-time grant writer, but if you have an idea for a grant, please come to us, and we'll see if we can find money to help you get it. Uh, we do have a hand up online from Joyce. Joyce. Joyce, is that a fresh hand or an old yes. hand? Fresh hand. All right. Joyce, you should be with us. There we go. So I support the grant. That's a wonderful thing, but I just want to make sure that we're not spending any town money on new trails or updating old trails that are just for people that are physically fit. We need to make sure that everything going here forward uh, takes into account those that may be in wheelchair or with a walker. They need to be able to access the outdoors also. And we need to make sure that everything going forward meets those criteria. And I hadn't heard that in this project yet. Yes, thank you. 
where the trail is. It's it's right by Casco Bay Motel too, so that that will provide that uh, reach. But this particular grant, um, in order to get it, it needs to uh, provide a wide range of recreation interests and abilities, including the elderly, individuals with disabilities, as well, exactly what you said. So this is exactly what this trail is planning to do. Great. Um, and there's a, a note on the agenda here that says we have about a little over $58,000 in our Concord Gully TIF, which is our new TIF that we did a few years ago. And part of the purpose of the TIF was four trails like this. So I think the note is there as a hint for us to say, yes, you can take the money out of that TIF. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you want to take it out of there, I think somebody would need to add it, be it further ordered, because Jessica said it would okay. be a supplemental budget appropriation. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? Before I ask Councilor Egan to read that, yeah, 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 come on up. Do you want to add that? Uh, sure. Feet further. Good evening again, Bob Stevens, Fifty Moose Crossing. Um, two thoughts on this. It sounds like the five hundred thousand um, and whatever the match is is what's going to be needed for what's being proposed. Another source of funds you were wise enough to include in the in the uh, LL Bean TIF, a provision for that would allow money that comes to the town to be used for this purpose. That's moving along at a quick pace. There's probably five hundred thousand dollars there already, or there soon will be. The other reason I'm in favor of this is uh, you've just adopted some goals that came from the. Uh, FSAB, and this includes uh, trying to reduce emissions fr uh, from vehicles, get people off roads. Although this is uh, set up as a recreation trail, it also will allow multi-use. It will allow people to use those short trips. You, For the short trips that so many of us take, can put it on a bicycle and go on this trail. That fits in with, with the plan, the goals that you've set. Freeport Climate Action now is in support of this for the same reason that you set the goals the way you did. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Peter Anzalini again. Um, so, reading the document and listening to what's going on. I think this is a $8,000 bait for hopefully a whale contract or a whale grant. Um, the $500,000 that's been mentioned, uh, that's the most I've ever given out. So, you know, there's for $8,000, you could get $10,000 back, right? You could get $50,000 back. So. So this is, this is fishing, you know, we're fishing. So the question is, is there something we can do locally with volunteers as opposed to spending the $8,000 for the bait? And, and because it doesn't sound like, um, from what the document says, it doesn't sound like we've got it mapped out about, okay, so we want a 30-foot trail. Can we see the grade of what's there? How long is it? How many people in that area? We don't have any of that data. So you're just throwing out bait, <laughs> and you're hoping for something. You know, I went fishing once, and I, um, the captain said, I said, you know, I really want to fish. And they said, this is called fishing, not catching, right? That's what you're, I think you're trying to do. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put the $8,000 until a better map, a better layout was done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Uh, Councillor Egan, do you want to read a motion for us? Sure. <clears throat> uh, be it ordered that a request from the Complete Streets Committee to hire a grant writer for an amount up to $8,000 to assist with the town's application for a land and water use conservation grant f uh, be approved be it further ordered that such funds be uh, deducted from the Concord Gully TIF 
account, which has an approximate balance of 58500 Second. Thank you. just have to switch that to a beard ordained. It has to be by ordinance to make a supplement. Beard ordained. Not be it further ordered? Yep. yep. Be it ordained. Be it ordained that the funds to support the Complete Streets Grant Rider request be taken from the Concord Gully TIF account. Got it. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. counselors. Uh, any other discussion? Uh, so all in favor of both of those. Aye. 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 Any opposed? So that carries six to zero. Thank you, uh, Barbara, for all your work on this, and please pass along our gratitude to the committee as well. And Adam, too, I know you've been pretty involved in that. So good luck fishing. Uh, next up, item 197.23, regarding a, awarding a bid for a new harbor master boat. And we have our harbor master to talk to us about this. We did set aside some money when we did our capital planning for this, and now it sounds like we're ready to buy the boat. So. All right, so I'll just um, kind of reiterate what Chief Goodman had on his note to you all. Um, so we did put out eight invitations for bids um, back in August that were due back uh, September 18th. Um, we got back three bids, one from Port Harbor Marine, um, Inventec Marine, and Maritime Skiff. Um, as Chief noted, we decided to go with the Maritime Skiff 25-foot Voyager, um, and they did come back with a price of 232776 which is obviously higher than that $180,000 uh, threshold. So we did have to, well, actually one of the reasons it was so high, I guess the, uh, the price of resin right now to make these molds, for whatever reason, like everything else, has gone up considerably, which... No one really predicted, but we um, also did make some cuts to some fairly important items that uh, we could do without, which included a tow post, dive door, fire suppression, suppression system, and a cabin heater. Um, and we are also getting a very fair trade-in for our current boat of 26700 um, which is higher than... Um, and we got for a price when we went to some of the local dealers asking what we would get for a trade-in value or what they would give us for our boat. So that was that was fair in our eyes, um, which did bring down their bid to 180000 from Maritime Skiff. Councilor Fournier. When I look at the specs, and I think I know the answer, but you... Uh, <clears throat> Next to the last item up, you have a stretcher deck support brackets, and that will support the stretchers that we're currently using for rescues on the islands or whatever that we currently don't have in the boat, which will make it a lot safer. That's correct, yep. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and that was kind of the main purpose of going two feet. So this boat is actually similar to, similar to the boat that we currently have. Um, obviously, it's, it's a newer model, and it's two feet bigger, a little bit beamier. Um, you know, so we are kind of catering a little bit to the fireside needs while still having a boat that is easy enough to do our day-to-day -day functions. Drafts the same amount of water, which is 14 inches, which is um, which is a good good draft here in Freeport, considering how tidal we are. And um, it's a boat we've had our eye on for a little while now. So, yep. I know we talked about this when we did our capital planning, but can you remind us how old the existing boat is and what the issues are with it? Yeah, so right now we have a 2016 Yamaha outboard, 225 horsepower. Um, it's got about 1,300 hours on it, so right now we're kind of right at that um, kind of hour range where you can still get some money for it, but where folks are kind of like, well, if you get any higher than that, you know, no one really wants a motor that has, you know, 1,500 hours on it. So, um, you know, a new motor installed on our boat, you know, is, is close to 38,000 just for the outboard alone. Um, our hull is a 2006, so it does have some age. It does have some uh, stress fractures um, around the cleats and um, along the eye bolt in the hull. Um, yeah, it's, it's just kind of at that age where... We were looking to upgrade. Um, Councilor Bradley? Was there any discussion about the change from Yamaha to Suzuki? Say that one more time. Did you have discussion about the change from Yamaha to Suzuki engines? 
Yes, we did, yeah. So this boat, um, it's going to have twin Suzuki's on it, and the way that they're geared, that you can only put Suzuki's on this particular model is what we're told. So, um, I mean, when you're comparing Yamaha and Suzuki, I'm actually, you know, a Yamaha guy, but um, recently Suzuki's kind of caught my eye. I mean, it's really kind of comparing Ford to Chevy. You know, they're, they're both top-notch motors. Um, so, so you, you don't feel you're taking a reduction in quality by higher, taking nope. Suzuki to get a price that you can afford? No. Nope. Yeah. Nope. My only question, when you mentioned the things that you cut from the boat, you mentioned you cut a cabin heater, which would seem important given how cold it is for so much of the year. Here. Yeah. I mean, our boat um, actually is the only, aside from the Coast Guard, we are actually the only boat that unless we get a real deep freeze in the Harris Secret River, we keep it in all year round. You know, we do have full-time lobstermen and aquaculturalists that go out of the town dock all year round. So um, aside from the Coast Guard in South Portland, uh, we're it in the winter in Casco Bay. Um, but yeah, heater was, was a hard cut for us, but. How much, yeah. Uh, was it right around five, yeah, right around five grand for a heater. I, I, and that it, it is, I mean, I've had some of my coldest days in that, in that, the boat we have now in, in January when you have to go out, so a heater would be ideal if we could, if we could stay out Kayakers out there in the winter going from island to island? You, Say that again? You have kayakers going out to We island. really don't have any kayakers, no. Um, most of the stuff that, that in the past, during the winter, um, you know, last winter I had to go out to Bustin's Island to you know, quite a few times for an individual out there. Um, just the, the random, you know, sighting of a boat that looks out of place or something that someone is concerned about. Uh, but no, no kayakers are few and far between as far as kayakers, unless they're in complete wetsuits and whatnot. But typically in January, that's pretty, uh, we don't see that a lot. We're going to do this. Let's do this right, and let's put the heater in there and have a piece of equipment that will operate in all types of weather, which we get in Maine. I think yep. we're yeah, I mean, social. a heater would be great, too, if you ever do have that, you know, hypothermic individual where you need to get them warmed up quickly. Yeah. It's a long ride, well, depending on where you are, back to the town dock or wherever you're trying to go in, in cold temps. So that would be much appreciated. What's that? Is there a number that would work that we could put back in here for that item? Uh, it, was, it was right around 5,000. I can get the exact, the exact, uh, which Greg might have it right over there. Can you remind us of the budgeted amount for this? So you. It was a 180. That was a 180,000. Okay. Oh, were you asking? I know you're asking just no, for me. You, you oh, okay. No, we were asking you. We're going to yeah. ask her where we can find more money. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm wondering if, uh, as opposed to us digging into where the funds are going to come up, if we went back to the chief and say, is there some savings in the budget somewhere or whatever? Uh, you know, it's amazing what department heads can do when <laughs> you throw a carrot out there. I've been there and we done keep that. Keep it warm in January. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm wondering, you know, uh, that if we could approve this tonight with a heater added and let Jessica and the chief figure out where that would come from. Well, I would just like to point out that this item is capital in nature, so the stuff with it and in, in on the boat at this time is considered part of the capital purchase. So it's not not designed to be split between capital and operating budget for those components, um, which is why when we met uh, to review the bids, it was, you know, you, you need to find a way to get to the 180000 but you need to let council know what's coming out, and the decision can be made whether you want to spend and appropriate more out of the capital reserve account um, for those purposes. So I'm sure... Um, these gentlemen could certainly give you some information on what was being recommended or proposed, I don't want to say recommended, but being proposed to cut out in order to meet what was initially appropriated um, as 
you know, I certainly don't have the authority to tell them to go over budget on this. So when the bids came back greater than expected, it was let's see what we can do to get it to the appropriation and let council make the decision on what gets added back should they choose anything. So, and I think he listed what, like four or five items that, you know, they were able to take out without, can, you know, impacting the integrity of the boat and the purpose, the core purpose of it, knowing that, you know, obviously some of these things make sense to put in at the beginning. I, you know, you want a boat that you can use year round. Um, that at a minimum is only makes sense. So. Councilor <coughs> Egan. Um, I believe we make decisions all the time during capital budget about additions, uh, additional equipment or improvements to the fleet of police cruisers, to the fleet of um, fire apparatus, and uh, I don't see the boat for the Harbor Master being any different than any of those, and a $5,000 additional increment seems to be well within um, the realm of what that um, capital budget can sustain, and I would support adding back the heater. Yep. so that we don't uh, get frostbite on our staff in January mm -hmm. doing their job. Councilor Pillsbury? I mean, the next item below saves $5,000. So is it a wash? No. Nope. There you go. It won't really be a wash now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the only other item that we did talk with uh, the fire side about was a kind of small compact fire suppression system, which was, uh, that was 4900 um, and that's simply just a simple pump that we can kind of stage on the dock. You know, it's, it's pretty lightweight that we can then transport in the boat if there is ever an emergency where a boat's on fire or something on Bustons, you know, you could, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so those are really the two, the two biggest, but the heater, I would say, would be awesome if you guys could help us out and keep us warm. So, Council Pillsbury, we're back to you. If you want to read the be it ordered and feel free to adjust the amount. Well, should it be the amount or just add the heater? That yeah. way it, it, we can figure out what the amount is after. We don't have to re-vote on. We need to put some amount in, right, that we're approving tonight? Well, 80, 180000 plus whatever the cost of the heater is. Instead of saying 5000 because if it comes in, it's 5500 It'd have to come to us, right? right? If we say one hundred eighty. Five thousand. It winds up being a little over. Is that? Do you need to come back to us, Jessica? Or would that be enough? I, at that rate, I would probably just absorb it in there. But that's okay. Okay. That should be. <laughs> so we're agreed at 185. Covers us. We don't have to bring it back. Okay. Bid ordered the Chislets Boating and Design LLC be awarded the bid in the amount of 185 thousand dollars. Second. Thank you, Councilor Lawrence. Any further? Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. All right, six to zero. We have a new Harbor Master boat. Thank, Thank you. you Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, we are up to our last item on our regular agenda before other business and executive sessions. Um, this is item 198.23 to consider action relative to awarding a comprehensive plan uh, bid. So, Caroline, I assume, has some information for us on that. Sure. Um, so we recently put out a bid for the comprehensive plan update. The budget and amount was $150,000, but the last time we went through a planning process, we realized that we needed to do additional public outreach, such as ads in the forecaster and some other things that we needed some funding for. So when we put the RFP out, we put it out for slightly under. So if we had to do additional publications to get public participation, we have that available to us. Um, so we put the RFP out, people had 27 days to respond. We actually got four responses and we put together an interview committee with two counselors, um, Ed and John, two planning board members, two project review board members, myself, our assistant planner, Cecilia, and Jessica, our finance director. Um, so we conducted interviews, we did references, and we looked at samples and overwhelming majority, um, the diverse committee recommended that we use North Star Planning. North Star Planning has had a relationship with the town of Freeport in the past. We used them for some ordinance work when we created the solar ordinance regulations when we were down a staff member in the planning department. They're currently working on other comprehensive plans in the area. And I think one of the things that appealed to the 
group about them is they came in with a diverse team. So they have not only the staff of North Star Planning, but they're also bringing in Jeff Levine, who's known for a lot of housing work in the region. Um, they are bringing in Bina, who's from FB Environmental, to do some of the environmental work. And they're bringing in Nacido, uh, Acido Landscape Architecture, who's done a lot of design work and visioning in other communities. Um, here tonight, you do have Ben Smith. He's the principal at North Star Planning here to introduce himself, if you'd like to meet him and hear a little bit about them before you take action on the request. Sounds like a wise move. <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening. Uh, ben Smith. I'm the principal at North Star Planning, and uh, I, I Thank Caroline for a, a good introduction of the, the process and uh, the team. Uh, I speak on behalf of the team when uh, I say we're very much looking forward to uh, engaging with the community and continuing the good planning work that the, the town has uh, already started uh, and has ongoing. Um, the proposal does include um, uh, regional experts in housing and natural resources. And uh, our focus, uh, the intent certainly of including uh, Aceto Landscape Architecture was to uh, help with that visual communication, both during the planning process as well as uh, in the final product itself. So I'd be happy to uh, discuss more, uh, but uh, you know, would, would leave it to your discretion. If you have any questions or I can provide more of an overview. I just have one quick question. What's the time frame for the whole process? Yeah, the, the uh, time frame in the proposal, I believe, was for a 22-month or might be 21-month project. It was certainly less than uh, 24 months, but it was more than 18. I think that uh, 22 was the number. I can pull up the proposal if you'd like. But no. the intent was, uh, as, as we said at the interview, to, to kind of keep this to a planning project as opposed to a, uh, an ongoing process that would be uh, years and years worth of commitment. This is, this is something that's going to have a definitive end date, and we're um, going to be working toward that. When we put out the RFP, we put 18 to 24 months. Okay. Um, so although Ben's here tonight, um, the goal is to, if approved by the council, execute the contract pretty quickly and have him before the planning board in December, because they're the ones that will lead the process for Freeport. Due to the ongoing climate action plan, we're trying to not cause public burnout and kind of finish one. So the first thing they would be working on is a lot of the data inventory chapters. So you might not see a lot of them at the beginning, because they'll be doing a lot of stuff mm -hmm. behind the scenes. But come spring, you'll be invited to a lot of meetings. We hope you'll join us, especially people that aren't on the council anymore. <laughs> Public comment. <laughs> Public comment, that's right. <laughs> Do you have a question, Councilor Bradley? No, but I, I, could we comment on the process sure. a little bit? Um, so we had a, a number of qualified applicants for this, and I guess the um, thing that impressed me about North Star was, one, the team idea. I mean, and that you had experts coming into the team that weren't necessarily employees, but were people who were almost consultants to you, but you have people you know and worked with on a number of projects. So there's a communication and a familiarity that's almost like staff, but has high, maybe, I want to higher powered <laughs> personnel that you're bringing with you. I liked that. Um, the other thing I liked was uh, uh, we had a number of applicants that were sort of betwixt and between about what the impact of the downtown visioning would be on this comprehensive plan process. and. You know, again, I don't, I'm no expert in planning, but I had always assumed that all the work we did on downtown visioning would inform at least the comprehensive plan process. And, and North Star uh, indicated that they believed that was true and were appropriate. They would, would go to the downtown visioning process for input and information and values that we have already identified. So those are reasons I thought they were a great fit for the town. Thanks, Ed. Any uh, questions? Uh, Councillor Fournier, would you read these motions? Certainly. Be it ordered that North Star Planning be awarded a bid for the comprehensive plan update in the amount of $144,726. Second. 
I'll be it further ordered that the town manager be authorized to execute the agreement on behalf of the town council. Second. Thank you, Council Lawrence. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. <laughs> Any opposed? Six to zero. That carries. Thank you. Look Looking forward, forward to it, Ben. Thank you very much. I, uh, I am as well. Thank you. Awesome. All right. That brings us to our last, our single item of other business, which is our audit presentation, which we have annually, and we have our representative to deliver that presentation. We have our finance director as well. Thank you. Uh, so I just would like to introduce Jen, um, Jen Connors. She is the partner on from Runyon Kirstein Willett that is on our engagement. Um, we literally just uh, wrapped this up the end of last week, if not Monday. <laughs> so uh, I don't have final copies of the report for you, um, but those will be coming. Uh, shortly, and I will make sure to email those out to you. But I will uh, turn it over to Jen uh, to take you through her interpretation and, and impression of the audit. Jessica, before you go, can and I? You're ask smiling, so this is going to be a really <laughs> good report. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just glad it's done. <laughs> can you post the presentation that you just handed out to us? Can you post that on the website for our meeting for tonight? So I can. Yes. I'll get, yes. I believe I sent you the latest version. You did. Okay, yeah. good. All right. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, as Jessica said, um, the reports, we would, um, in an ideal world, you would have a set of the, the reports to review before we met with you, but unfortunately, we did run into some snags. Um, as far as the audit itself, the... Um, the reports also include the information from FD, FEDC, uh, Freeport Economic Development Corporation, and uh, we ran into a little bit of a delay with uh, some information related to their payroll management company. I don't know how much I want to go into that, but suffice it to say, uh, you will have final reports uh, shortly thereafter. So this is just a brief overview of the audit itself. And I would like to thank Jessica and the staff here. Um, we had another uh, great audit, clean as usual, uh, very well organized. And uh, we appreciate all the work that they put into uh, preparing for the audit. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to jump in anytime. I'm just going to go ahead and, and go right into the graphs. So on the second page, we have an overview of the audit itself to give you an idea of the timing. Uh, we were here for a day on June 13th to do some pre-audit work. At that time, we usually uh, gather information for the audit. We do some of the testing for internal controls. And then we came back the week of July 31st to do the field work for the audit itself. As far as the results of the audit, uh, the financial statements did receive an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion on the financial statements. In addition, uh, besides auditing the financial statements themselves, we are required to do testing under government auditing standards. And under those standards, we are required to test internal controls as they relate to financial reporting. Uh, this year in particular, we did a full test of the cash disbursements process for the town as well as cash disbursements for FEDC. The areas that we didn't test in full, uh, we typically do limited procedures for those. Uh, typically, if we don't have any issues from last year's testing, then we're allowed to rotate those areas. Um, and under that uh, guidance, uh, there were no material weaknesses and there were no significant deficiencies. Um, we didn't even have any minor recommendations. So again, very clean as far as testing for internal controls as well. Uh, if you would like to flip to the third graph, the rest of these graphs are an overview of the financial statements themselves. Uh, so we're going to kind of go into the numbers um, that came from the financial statements. So in the third graph, we have an overview, overview excuse me, of the general fund fund balance. 
uh, over the last five fiscal years, and it's broken down into the different um, categories within the fund balance. Uh, the first portion would be non-spendable, and that is the portion that has already basically been spent. It's typically made up of uh, prepaid expenditures or inventory. Uh, the next step down from that would be committed fund balance, and that represents amounts that have been set aside for tax stabilization, for future employee benefits, and for uh, reserves. And that amount uh, has increased 9% over the last five fiscal years. The next step down from that is the assigned category. Uh, that is the portion of fund balance that has been set aside to be used in the next fiscal year. Uh, that amount was set at 600,000 uh, the first three fiscal years here, and then it did increase to 675,000. And then finally, you have an uns unassigned category, which is what's left over after you put amounts into all of those other categories. Unassigned fund balance actually decreased about 6% over the last five fiscal years. In total, fund balance also decreased by about 1.5 million or 17% from fiscal year 2022. And total fund balance has decreased by about $66,000 uh, since 2019. Uh, the next few graphs will kind of go into uh, why you had the change in fund balance in particular. Uh, so on the fourth page you have the general fund revenues. This is a budget to actual uh, comparison. And so looking at some of the larger variances, taxes were higher than budgeted than actual. Uh, as property tax revenues include overlay, uh, net of abatements, as well as there are excise taxes, excuse me, <laughs> which exceeded the budget by about $328,000. Intergovernmental revenues were also higher than budgeted uh, due to state revenue sharing that was $115,000 higher than budgeted due to changes at the state level. In addition, you had reimbursements for homestead exemption and general assistance that were also higher than anticipated by $230,000 and $47,000, respectively. <coughs> Charges for services were higher than budgeted, uh, mostly due to recycling center revenues that were higher than anticipated. Fees and fines uh, were lower than budgeted, as revenues from parking and police fines were lower than anticipated. And overall, uh, total revenues were higher than anticipated by about 4%. On the fifth page, uh, we have the same uh, display for the general fund expenditures. Again, the budget to actual variances. Uh, general Sorry. government Jen, expenditures were you? under Just budget due to a position that was budgeted but paid for with grant funds. I'm sorry, could I interrupt? Just one quick clarification question. Oh, sure, sure. Um, on the um, detail of the revenues in your notes on the right, it said net of abatements, excise taxes, which exceeded the budget by 328. Is that just excise tax that created yes. that increase? Yes. Which is uh, registrations and vehicles and those kind of things? Yes. So that, that was $328,000 higher than what we budgeted for. That's correct. Thank you. Just want to get that clear. It's a lot of new cars. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Public works expenditures were under budget. Uh, there was less road work that was completed due to staff shortages. Um, in addition, there were budgeted positions that were not filled. Community services expenditures were over budget due to unanticipated increase in general assistance costs, and this was offset uh, by an increase in state reimbursements. Insurance and benefits were under budget due to staffing changes and enrollment elections for health insurance. And in total, expenditures before transfers out were under budget by 1%, so uh, they were very close. And at the very bottom of the graph, you'll see that there are transfers out of about $2.6 million that were not budgeted. These are the amounts that were transferred to the reserves, and that is based on fund balance policy. Uh, so that is the main reason why 
that the general fund fund balance did decreased is because of those transfers out to the reserves. Excuse me, I have a question on reserves. When we look at that, uh, are you in a position to say that we're doing the right thing on reserves, or do we need to have more money in reserves? That's my pet peeve, as Jessica will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know that I can speak to the the correct level of reserves. Um, I know that I, you have transferred money to your reserves in accordance with your fund balance policy um, but beyond that I mean that that really is a management decision as far as how much you you put in those reserves and how much you spend out of those reserves you want to add to that at all well I mean I can certainly give opinion on reserve <laughs> levels but I think for the purpose of the audit presentation then I'll save that for the budget process <laughs> On uh, page six, we have a graph of the unassigned fund balance as a percentage of budget. Uh, this graph can be used to kind of gauge how healthy your unassigned fund balance. Um, this is, and this uh, is shown over the last five fiscal years. Uh, so 2023 is all the way over to the right. And you can see that uh, unassigned fund balance as a percentage of budget actually decreased from fiscal year 2022. Um, to 14 percent. Now the town does have a fund balance policy uh, that is a target of one and a half months of the budget, which is approximately 12.5 percent, with an additional 5 percent of the target allowed for maximum fund balance. So you have sort of a, a floor and a ceiling there. Now compared to the FY 2024 budget, the FY 2023 unassigned fund balance exceeds the maximum by about $26,000. Now, I've been doing this uh, presentation for a few years, and I can tell you that that is actually the closest I've ever seen your unassigned fund balance to that, uh, to that policy. So that is very close to that. I was sweating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On uh, page seven, um, we have the expenditures expressed as a pie chart. So again, this is just the expenditures for the general fund. Each category is expressed as a percentage of total expenditures. So we have the 2023 uh, pie chart to the left and then the 2022 pie chart to the right so you can compare the two fiscal years. Uh, you can see most of the categories are relatively the same. Uh, you do have some changes in transfers to other funds, which increased from 2% to 7%. Public safety did decrease slightly from 10% to 9%. Community services increased 1%. It went from 2% to 3%. And education actually decreased from 62% to 57%. Uh, the only other thing that I would point out here is that debt service shows up as 0%, and that's not because you don't have any debt service, but it's uh, so low as a percentage that it's less than 1%. Okay. On page 8, uh, we have an overview of the town reserves. And so this is where that two point six million dollars went uh, was into these reserves so uh, the police department reserve increased uh, by about two hundred and sixty three thousand dollars and that had to do with transfers in to be used for boat and vehicle replacements as well as protective equipment the fire department reserve decreased due to the purchase of a fire truck and SCBA bottles with a filling station the rescue department reserve increased due to a transfer in to be used for ambulance replacement. The comprehensive improvement reserve increased due to transfers in to be used for Mallet Drive uh, slash Durham Road and the Flying Point Road reconstruction. Municipal buildings reserve increased uh, due to transfers in for various projects. 
And the capital projects uh, reserves also increased due to transfers in and revenues that exceeded expenditures and transfers out. So in total, um, reserves increased by about $1.5, $1.6 million, which is a 13% increase. And the last graph we have here is an overview of the town's other funds. Uh, we typically focus on the general fund simply because it is the largest, the most important fund of the town. It is where your main operations are accounted for. However, you do have these other funds that appear on your financial statements as well. Uh, they include the Winslow Park Fund, your TIF funds, uh, the Bartol Building Fund, the Tower Lease Fund, um, town grants, which are made up of a bunch of different uh, grants and donations, the Gorman Fund, and then your net fund. Uh, so this is a comparison of 2022 to 2023. Uh, you can see all of the funds uh, either increased or stayed relatively the same, with the exception of the net fund, uh, which the net fund did have a slight deficit last year, and then in fiscal year 2023, that fund was closed. And that is it for what I have for graphs. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. I have, I have two, and I don't know if they're for you or for Jessica, but on the last page, it shows there's $500,000 in a Bartle building fund. What is that? Do we have money available for maintaining the building? Uh, speak to that? I'll take this one. Sure. Uh, yeah. So the Bartol building, when it was, when it uh, historically had been leased under a long-term lease, uh, there was a significant amount of revenue that came in on a regular basis that would fund both our capital reserves as well as the general fund, and a portion also went into this Bartol building reserve uh, in order to help with building improvements and things that may need to be done and has been being used since the loss of that lease um, to help maintain and pay for the expenses of operating that building. So the painting and things that we need to do the building now are being taken from that fund? Yes. Great. Yep. Um, my other question is on the TIF funds. They're just higher than I thought they would be because I thought the downtown TIF was more like 200000 and we saw that Concord Gully is only 50. Yeah, so this is this is as a, a point in time. It, it doesn't, it, it takes, what you're seeing is where we're at um, based on what's been put into that account through tax base revenue as well as where we're currently at for spending as of June 30th. So it's not taking into consideration anything that's budgeted to be expended out of it or in the future that's going to be coming out of it. It's it's just literally that so there might be some midnight at June thirtieth. Enhancement money that we need to pay out of it. Things Correct. Like yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Mm -hmm. I forgot that was it. Okay. All right, here comes a num nut. Um, so reserves are an issue for me as well as Daryl and um, I saw <clears throat> reserves in two places here, in, and I don't understand the relationship between the two places. So could you help me find the places and then tell me what the distinction is? Uh, what do you mean you saw it in two places? No, that was the problem. I'm I, thinking I, I, probably I, was, I thought the I was fund going balance. well until I saw the 13.5% increase at the end. Yeah, so that, that was the breakout of the reserves uh, in their balances as of that point in time on page 8. Right. Yep. So that's gone up 13% despite the fact that we are within $26,000 of our policy. So I, I was going to speak to this if nobody asked. So, yes, the reserve balance increased because if you remember correctly, after last year's fiscal audit and before the start of the FY24 budget process, I came and asked you for $1.9 million to transfer from fund balance into reserves to help fund what we would need for projects. 
um, and council graciously awarded that to be transferred, which is the primary increase that you see from the 12 million to the 13.5. Um, and so when you got this report last year, we were over our fund balance policy maximum level that Jen talked about, that range, we were over the maximum by that 1.9 million. So the recommendation was that we take that 1.9 million and, and move it to reserves to fund our capital projects. This year, I only have $26,000. I'm not coming to you with any recommendation where it's gonna stay in fund balance because we're within our policy. So the 13% increase <coughs> refers to what the point in time post this year. Right, so that 13% increase implies that we took last year's activity and we added the 1.9 million that you transferred, but it hasn't taken into consideration yet the 3.6 million that you appropriated to be spent out of the capital plan for FY24. So, so it's, that's it's done, it'll be a lot less than 13. 100%. <laughs> yeah. And then in the $26,000 that we're crowing about is, excuse me, talking about is uh, the uh, 2023 number. Correct. And it, and so there's sort of, it's like different Correct. different universes. Which is why last year when I gave you the report and asked for the 1.9, I mentioned this is not an annual thing. I will not always have 1.9 million to ask for you. We had a few extenuating circumstances last year with revenues that were conservatively budgeted um, coming in greater than that budget as well. So it, it gave a greater increase and we had some budgetary expense savings that kind of, come. I, I'm sorry, when I say last year, I mean 2022, right? And so we had those savings in 2022 as well as unanticipated revenues that were greater than budgeted. In FY, so we asked to transfer that money. In FY23, Peter and I worked together on the budget. We really narrowed in on the revenues and said we can't, well, I was, I was, it was mentioned we should not be quite so conservative in our budgeting of revenue numbers uh, based on the trend of actuals coming in. And it, it's not wrong, I, you know, so we adjusted the budget. We, we narrowed that margin um, to the tune of $26,000. So it was a little closer than I probably would have gone on my own to ask for a narrowed margin, but you know, we're working with it. So knock on wood for 24. <laughs> we just paid for the boat heater in the harbor man. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe something else too. Right. So is it fair to say- Jessica paid for it, I should say. We, last year we added $1.9 million to reserves. Correct. During the year we spent 3 point something million dollars out of reserves. From in the budget process, yes. You asked for 3.6 million in the budget. Okay, we put in 1.9, asked for 3.6. And this year we don't have any money to replenish it. That is correct. Okay. <laughs> that is, we will definitely, we will, other than what's already in there. And we got, and we got It will definitely be an interesting budget season. Um, you will probably see shifts and changes of, of projects being pushed out. Yeah. Because you, you will not have the refunding of the reserve. And, so. and we're looking at probably a $2 million ladder truck. Right. That has already been pushed out for a number of years. Correct. Right. So, oh, right. yeah, and that's and that's Small one department. <laughs> in that direction, one way or another. Smaller reserves. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not to say bonding is not an option. You know, as Jen pointed out, our debt service is less than one percent. Um, but it it just means being creative. If there are things that are sticking points that council wants to see, there it's going to be a discussion, and it's not necessarily going to be you know, fundable by reserve. It, it, there will be alternate funding sources needed. And this has been a discussion I hope all of you can remember in the, in the back of your minds for the last five years that she's reporting on. I, I have repeatedly said our reserves are not going to last, uh, you know, forever at, at the rate we're going without having refunding mechanisms. So. Remember. I'll step off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> See why. Thank you, Jen, for the report and for all the work that goes into the report, which I know takes way more time than we give you to report on it. So I appreciate all that. And thanks to Jessica for running such a 
a smooth department where the uh, recommendations are uh, unmodified, no material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, and not even any minor recommendations. So well done. That's yeah. That is uh, something I'm pretty happy about. So yeah. that should be us too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am as well. Yeah. <laughs> thank you again. No issues is a good thing. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so that brings us to our executive session, um, which I'll read out, and then after we go into executive session, we'll take a break. Um, we have two executive sessions. We need to vote on each one separately. So we're going to have executive session, we'll exit that, then we'll go into another executive session, exit that. I don't anticipate coming back into public session because I don't think we have to vote on anything tonight. Um, but with that preamble, um, our next item is to consider action relative to an executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA 4056A pertaining to a personnel matter. Baker Tilly will be present to discuss the town manager search. So I move that we go into uh, that the town council enter executive session. Second. second. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. All, uh, Councillor Pillsbury? Aye. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Lawrence? Yes. Councillor Bradley? Two. Councillor Egan? Yes. And Councillor Pilch? Moves yes, as well. We are in executive session and we'll take a five minute break. Right. 